afternoon, everybody. It's really my honor to welcome you at uh, today's webinar, COVID-19 and cashless payments. Uh, has coronavirus changed Europeans' love of cash? So all of us, we pay more and more uh, without cash. Uh, and uh, this is also our experience uh, uh, during uh, nowadays crisis. Uh, there are different experiences uh, country by country in the European Union, but there is generally the same trend everywhere that people use more cashless payments. I have to say there are three major advantages. First one is uh, simplicity. It is much better simplicity of financial transactions. Secondly, there is uh, better transparency because also there is definitely less corruption if you have less cash. And thirdly, last but not least, uh, higher economical efficiency, particularly for small and medium entrepreneurs, there is less cost for transport of cash and, uh, for example, security cost. So definitely there is uh, more and more advantage to uh, use less cash, but uh, I have to say that we asked our SMEs during this year, what is their advantage, uh, what is their preference, and definitely the, despite the fact that there was the trend uh, to use more cashless payments, they would like to use a variety of choices. So uh, the policy of the European Union should be to provide more choices and to not uh, definitely focus only on one, one type of, uh, of payments. My personal experience is uh, that uh, honestly, I don't uh, use uh, cash uh, anymore because uh, uh, we have good infrastructure for cashless payments. Uh, just personally, 10 years ago, when I went to buy my Big Mac to McDonald's, I couldn't buy by, uh, by my credit card, just by cash. Now it is opposite. We cannot pay by cash at McDonald's. This is just one example. So definitely, I think uh, we need better digital infrastructure, but uh, what we need also we need better infrastructure for cash light payments. And uh, I do believe it is the trend for the whole European Union to use more and more cashless payments, which will be also on uh, uh, for, for goods of uh, our SMEs, uh, talking from SMEs perspective. And I'm really very happy that, that we have uh, great speakers today, particularly my very good friend, uh, Mr. Burghard Baltz, a former MEP. And also, uh, I'm happy that uh, moderation will be dealt uh, by Stefan Gerold, also former MEP. So, um, gentlemen, over to you. Over to you, Stefan. Thank you, Ivana, for your uh, nice introduction. And thank you, everybody, for um, showing up at this, this webinar uh, and for the interest yeah, that you're that's showing in the, uh, in the issue uh, that we're going to talk about today. Um, I think we have indeed a, a, a fair variety and, and a very good selection of speakers in our today's seminar. Um, and um, I would like to start with um, a keynote speaker, uh, who's Burkhard Baltz. Um, first of all, a, a longtime friend of mine. Uh, we, in the, we, we serve for the same party in the same county branch of province branch of our Christian Democrat Party. So. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I feel very comfortable, uh, comfortable because I'm, I feel at home, Burkhard. Thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, Burkhard Baltz is a banker by trade. Uh, he worked for the Commerzbank Corporation until 2009. He then joined the European Parliament as an MEP and became coordinator of the um, uh, caucus of the European People's Party in the uh, Ecken Committee in 2014. He then left the European Parliament in 2018 to uh, assume his new position as the Vice President of the German Central Bank in Frankfurt, and that's where he is right now. And um, he will open uh, he will open our today's uh, webinar. So, Burkhard, to you, and uh, we are, we will be listening attentively. Well, thank you, uh, Stefan, for the kind introduction. And uh, it's also good to see Ivan and uh, Georgios again, uh, also from my side. Hello. Good to see you and all the other colleagues and friends. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, this afternoon and uh, also for giving me the opportunity to talk about a 
a very virulent topic, the consequences of COVID-19 for payments. Uh, do you remember the term of disruption? If I remember it rightly, uh, that was one of the biggest buzzwords five years ago when blockchain, fintech, platformication were the talk of the town, also uh, in Brussels at that time. Uh, dis disruptive elements are, are still at a play, of course, but we only really saw uh, the true meaning of disruption this year. The threat of the pandemic forced people worldwide uh, to totally change their day-to-day -day habits. Many pleasurable activities that people had taken for, for granted suddenly became impossible. Traveling to exciting places all over Europe, going to nice restaurants or meeting with family and friends. Public life as we knew it ground to, to a complete halt. And this uh, resulted in a dramatic economic downturn with uh, widespread insolvencies and uh, unemployment cushioned to a greater or lesser degree by government support in many of our European countries. This was truly disruptive in the worst possible sense of the word. However, there's a famous saying, every cloud has a silver lining. And indeed we have uh, uh, observed some disruption in the positive sense of the term. The pandemic has facilitated and driven change. Uh, it has turned out to be a catalyst for digital transformation and thus an innovation accelerator for the entire economy. Apart from getting used to face masks, for many people it was the first time they did shopping online, the first time they had remote video conversations with colleagues, friends and family, and the first time they started to follow movie series via uh, streaming services. This uh, quantum leap in digitalization has also seen a boom in cashless payments. On the one hand, this was a consequence of the uptick in online shopping. One indicator of this might be the rise in transactions with uh, PayPal registered worldwide in the second quarter of 2020 compared to the first quarter. Its transaction increased from about 3.26 billion to around 3.74 billion. And the general decline in shopping activities makes uh, these figures even more uh, impressive. And on the other hand, the shift towards cash and payments had something to do with preventing transmission of the virus. While uh, handling banknotes and coins is not a likely cause of infection, the wish to avoid was still reason enough for many retailers to start offering card payments more actively. And for many payers in Germany, it was the first time they realized that they already had not just a card in their wallet, but a card with contact payments, payment features. So the acceptance of uh, these payment methods experienced a surge uh, as even the notoriously conservative German consumer became aware of the advantages this uh, new and easy to handle payment instrument has to offer. Recent uh, figures from GiroCard, the German uh, debit card system run by the banking sector seem also to confirm uh, this change. The number of GiroCard transactions in the first half of this year was 20%. 21% precisely up uh, on the first two quarters of 2019, climbing to altogether 2.6 billion transactions. And about 50% of all GiroCard transactions were contactless 
in the first two quarters of 2020, up from 25% in June 2019. So the question is now, whether the habits acquired in times of uh, disruption are here to stay. I think uh, they very well might be. Bundesbank online surveys of April and May 2020 found out that 20, no, 73% of respondents who changed their payment behaviors during the pandemic said they would probably or even certainly stick to this new behavior. So COVID-19 was definitely a catalyst because we had already seen in 2019 that cashless payments were becoming more popular and the shift from cash to cards was uh, stronger than in the preceding uh, years. But with a 73 share of transactions, cash is not on the way out, at least not in our country in Germany. Nevertheless, the uh, changing shape of the payments and settlements landscape raises questions that go to the very heart uh, of the central bank's core functions. With the onset of uh, COVID-19, talk about digital central bank currency, we call it CBDC, seems to be that uh, much of uh, out of the scope in the eyes of an average consumer. Technology advances such a DRT technology, which open up with uh, fresh opportunities, for example, in the internet of things, and also the initiatives pursued by other central banks and private companies to develop new means of payment, for example, Libra, have triggered debate of the future of payments. Uh, in January this year, the governing council of the ECB established a high level task force in order to advance joint work on CBDC. And uh, being the Bundesbank's executive board member uh, responsible for the area of payments, I'm a member of this group. Uh, recently, on, on 2nd of October, we published the first results of our analysis. The main question to be asked is this, under what conditions might it become necessary to introduce CBDC for the general public or even a digital euro? A structural decline in demand for cash, general support for digital transformation and uh, potentially competing other offerings of digital money from big tech firms or other central banks are mentioned as possible motives for issuing a digital euro. And this, colleagues and friends, brings me back to disruption. The debate, the debate on the digital euro has just started. My impression is that uh, many stakeholders in the economy have only now begun to understand this thing called CBDC. The banking sector players who run successful business models for cashless payments especially need to, to grasp what it means to issue a digital euro in the euro area. And some challenges would uh, need to be overcome in this regard, particular concerning the potential impact on banking business, financial stability, and of course also the central bank uh, balance sheet. Whether we will issue a digital euro is something which has not yet been decided. I would like to mention the ongoing public consultation, which is open until the 12th of January 21. The aim of uh, this consultation is to find out the opinions of individuals, companies, and other stakeholders of the digital euro which we need to take on board when reaching a decision about an imminent go, uh, no go, or a go later. Considering what uh, COVID-19 has taught us about real disruption, I think there needs to be a response 
to the growing demand in the economy for cheap, quick, and convenient means of payment, which can also be used in new payment situations like machine-to-machine -machine payments. Our house, the Bundesbank, is deeply engaged in the debate uh, on CBDC, but we are also thinking about alternative solutions which could avoid disruption and help overcome the existing challenges, react the benefits of going digital and support new payment use cases without introducing CBDC. One way could be to enhance uh, conventional payment system, both at a domestic and also at a global level. And in this respect, we urge the market to develop a pan-European payment solution with full deployment of the new instant payments infrastructure. In addition, we believe uh, that the roadmap developed by the Financial Stability Board provides an excellent plan to enhance cross-border payments. And in this respect, it also becomes clear that uh, CBDC is not, is not a panacea. The challenges we face are multi-faced and we need to find a whole array of tailor-made solutions to them. We are also examining the possibilities of interlinking blockchain-based solutions with uh, conventional payment systems like our real-time growth settlement system target two. For example, the technical link between a, a smart contract on a blockchain could automatically trigger payment in target two. And this will have also the benefit that the existing payment infrastructure could be used in a tokenized economy without upon any financial disruption to the division of labor between central banks and the financial sector. So friends, let me summarize. Introducing CBDC is not just a technical decision, it's definitely a policy stance. And therefore to prevent disruption, a comprehensive conceptual analysis and assessment of CBDC compared to the alternatives needs to be carried out, especially with a view to the fulfillment of our mandate, but also regarding its impact on the society. And now I'm uh, looking very much uh, forward to hearing your views on the consequences of COVID-19 for Europeans' love of cash. So thank you very much for the kind uh, invitation and thank you also very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Burkhardt, for this uh, very comprehensive uh, introduction. Um, you pointed out in particular that there is reliable data that cashless payment has significantly increased through the COVID-19 crisis, and that COVID-19, you, you call it, and it had become in a certain way a catalyst uh, of the uh, of the ways people um, people would. Um, um, would uh, engage in their payments in, in the European Union. Um, and a very interesting question then you, you, you raised uh, finally, um, uh, under which conditions might it become possible and maybe adequate to introduce the digital uh, euro and you mentioned uh, central bank digital currency as an, uh, as an example. Uh, we, we can talk widely about this and very interesting that also that you consider this a uh, not only a technical decision, but rather a political stance um, that uh, uh, to, to introduce uh, CBDC or maybe the, the digital euro uh, finally uh, and uh, eventually as a, um, as a mean of uh, payment alone. Um, so I would now like to ask uh, Alexon Schirmeister uh, to uh, comment maybe on what he's heard and comment on the situation in general. Uh, Alexander von Schirmeister holds a Bachelor of Science in International Business from Georgetown University uh, School of Business and acquired an MBA from INSEAD Business School in 1998. 
Uh, he was appointed Executive Vice President for Europe of SOMOP in September 2019. Uh, previously, he held the position of a Vice President Marketing Operations and Advertising, um, and then Vice President at EMEA Expansion and Cross-Border Trade at eBay. Uh, between 2017 and 2018, uh, he was a member of the Innovation Council of the Confederation of British Ind Industry. Uh, Mr. von Schiermeister, um, we're looking forward to what you have to say, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Gerald, and thank you, uh, Mr. Bautz, earlier for, for the uh, words and the perspectives of the Deutsche Bundesbank. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to actually try and share some slides, not so much because I want to bore you with PowerPoint, but because I actually brought a few data points, maybe just to illustrate what we've heard so far. So. You can just let me know if you if you can see the slides I'm sharing. Yes, we can. Can somebody it. just give? Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, let, let me maybe just provide a little bit of perspective on what SumUp has seen on the European landscape, uh, certainly this year, and to what extent we have seen the pandemic have an effect on the payment landscape. Um, and I don't think that any particular payment phenomenon has been triggered by the pandemic, but we're certainly seeing a significant acceleration of trends uh, that had been in the making for, for several years uh, across Europe. And different European markets are reacting to them quite differently. Uh, just a very brief brief kind of uh, background so you know why I'm even talking to you in the first place. Uh, sum up, we are a company that really believes in small businesses being successful, what they love. And so we have products and we design products specifically for small and medium enterprises, for small entrepreneurs. But our company was founded in 2011 as a mobile point of sale company. We started by selling these devices and we make the uh, acquisition of them very simple. The um, setting up an account, very, very easy. And so any entrepreneur or small business which may have been cash only and is thinking of acquiring or starting to transact with cards, this is a very easy way to do it, right? No contracts, very quick activation and hence very rapid cash um, card acceptance. And with that, we've, we've grown. We now serve uh, over 2 million merchants across 32 countries, uh, Europe, uh, Latin America and the US. Most of our merchants are very small. They do less than 10,000 euros transaction volumes per month. We may have a few outliers that, outliers that go into the 50,000 euro range, but the vast majority are very, very small merchants. And we serve those with 2,300 employees, um, many of them in Berlin. Now, when you look at the type of merchants we have, uh, they may be bakers. This is a vintage shop seller in Germany. This is a donut seller somewhere in the UK. This is a vintage shop seller in, in, in the US. We, we really represent merchants across a vast variety of sectors from the gardener to the yoga teacher, to the retailer, to the little coffee shop, to the food truck, and hence have a pretty good visibility on the payment landscape across um, the different European countries. Now, let me get to what has happened this year during the pandemic. Um, because our transaction and ultimately our revenue depends very heavily on the total payment volume of our merchants, the moments our merchants started going into lockdowns, we obviously saw that reflected in our numbers immediately. And this just shows you how, uh, from the beginning of this year, the, the, the total payment volume we have observed and how once we started seeing the first indications of the pandemic hitting uh, Italy and the Lombardy region in particular, and then how different countries or different cities started doing less strict or stricter measures of lockdowns, how we ultimately saw a significant decline of payment volumes on car transactions via our devices. And this is a pretty good reflection of what was going on in the economy in general. What has happened is since the lockdowns were then lifted towards the end of May, early June in different countries and in different sectors, we have started seeing that economy and most of the merchants come back. And, and this is one point I will make that in general and on average, we have seen the vast majority of our merchants come back. Uh, we have seen some attrition or churn rate, merchants that just have not reactivated. And you can assume as to whether that is because they've gone entirely out of business or simply have had to delay their activity. There may be some seasonal business across the summer, but for the most part, most sectors are now open. 
uh, an obvious sector that isn't at the same rates they were at at the beginning of the year is anything related to travel, host, uh, hostels, uh, hotels, taxis, limo services, etc. But the other thing you're seeing is that our transaction volumes not only have recovered, but they're actually higher than what they were at the beginning of the year. And this is mostly because we are seeing a transition from what used to be more cash transactions to more car transactions. Now, something else which is interesting, this is uh, data from Germany. When you look at search interest on search uh, engines, whether uh, Google or Bing, of people looking for card payment or card payment solutions, we see that the interest for card payment solutions has increased. And it did so particularly as the economies were reopening. And we, we did qualitatively hear from many of our merchants that we're opening again that they were now looking into making sure they had the proper payment methods available for their consumers as they opened their stores again, uh, which you see reflected here with significant increase. The other thing that we have been observing is a significant shift in behavior of the people that are paying with a card. Obviously you can pay with a card by you know, inserting a card and putting the pin into the device or increasing with a contactless. Uh, the schemes across Europe have increased the contactless limit. It used to be somewhere around 30 euros, 30 pounds, depending on which market you were in. And that has been increased, allowing consumers to make higher transactions contactless. And we have generally seen from the beginning of the year to, the, to now that the rate of contactless has now increased to um, over 40% of all transactions, while the rate of chip and pin transactions have decreased. Now, when we ask merchants uh, on the one hand, why they think uh, this transition is happening, we know from, and this is uh, data we borrowed from a MasterCard study, the consumers are saying that one of the top reasons for now using contactless is because it is cleaner and more convenient. So cleanliness or, or health safety is a very, very big factor. On the other hand, when we ask our merchants whether they think that the contactless payments are likely to, um, stay and to what extent they may be due to COVID-19. Again, 52% of them say yes, they do think that COVID-19 has led to this increase in contactless payments. And then last but not least, just, just some data on Germany. Even in Germany, we have seen that the average transaction amounts per transactions have declined quite significantly during this year from near 60 euros per transactions to uh, roughly 45 euros. And this is partially driven by the fact that many smaller transactions, your small transaction at the baker or your small transaction, which may just have been a couple of euros, which you typically would have settled in cash. And many merchants would actually have discouraged it by saying, you know, cards only accepted starting at 10 euros or 15 euros. Some of that is falling away. As a result, we are seeing our merchants doing more transactions, but on average of smaller amounts. So I just wanted to illustrate and give you a couple of data points in terms of what we have seen of the changing behaviors. Uh, we are convinced that COVID-19 hasn't necessarily generated a uh, revolution on the payment landscape, but it is significantly accelerating trends that we would have seen in Europe for quite some time. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. von Schirmeister. Um, uh, the you pointed out that the interest for card payments so card payment solutions uh, peaked during the pandemic and those figures are uh, to, in my eyes consistent with the data provided by vice president Burkhard Balz is an, an, is an inter interesting point in your last chart that i would like to maybe answer uh, my, like like you to answer uh, afterwards um, uh, why the decline in cash payment started even before uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, um, kicked in, 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 let's say, in February or March 2020, um, because the decline, if, if I, if I um, interpret the chart correctly, already started in December 2019. That'd be, uh, yes. be a very interesting uh, interesting point. Maybe you you want to you want to quickly answer yeah. that. Uh, is there any any uh, analysis or any assessment you would like to make? As yeah, very very happy to. The reality is, you really have an ecosystem between the consumer and the merchant. Uh, consumers are increasingly looking for convenience. Uh, they don't want to be going to the ATM machine every couple of days and load up on cash anymore. They have payment devices on their body uh, at all times. Not only 
in cards, but increasingly embedded into their mobile phones. Or you now even see payment gadgets like payment rings or, or payment watches. And so the consumers on the one hand are putting pressure on the merchants to offer better services. And that includes payment, uh, um, cashless transactions. Uh, and so the merchants are, are seeing the same. In Germany, which is very interesting because Germany is one of the, the bastions of resistance when it comes to cash payments um, and continues being so even during the pandemic compared to other markets. Um, but even in Germany, you will observe that typically urban centers uh, exposed to a lot of tourism are likely to move to card much more rapidly. Uh, if you, you know, we're, we're near Alexanderplatz in Berlin. Um, if you go around Alexanderplatz in Berlin, card acceptance is typically very, very much uh, something that has now penetrated the Berliner behaviors, whereas the moment you start leaving the touristy areas, that changes. And so I think that ecosystem of the consumer uh, demanding and requesting more simplicity and convenience and then hence putting pressure on the merchant, and on the other hand, the merchant wanting to satisfy that, uh, has been driving that for quite some time. And as I said, the pandemic now accelerates that. Okay, okay. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Neil Macmillan is our next keynote speaker. I would like to introduce Mr. Macmillan. Hello. Um, Mr. Macmillan uh, has always been engaged in matters of, matters of trade and industry, um, and he's been Eurocommerce's Director for Political Affairs and Trade since uh, 2015. Before that, he held uh, various positions of the Director of EU Policy at the Department of Trade and Industry, in the UK government, as well as deputy permanent representative to the UN and UK representative to the WTO from 2001 to 2005. So a very experienced and long time uh, UK official, uh, Mr. McMillan, floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed for that <coughs> introduction. <coughs> I can say it's my birthday today, so I'm even older than, than that long experience you just mentioned. <laughs> um, I think I'd like to, first of all, start by saying I agree very much with what we've heard from Mr. Boats and also from the, um, the previous speaker. What has happened, I think, with COVID is very clear that, first of all, when a lot of shops were closed, people had no choice if they wanted to buy something which that shop was selling to go online. And going online for 90% of people means using a card. So on the whole, um, what we have seen is card transactions increase very much. If I give you some small figures without going into too much detail, but on food, which is really been the poor relation, if you like, on online sales, at the height of the pandemic across Europe, food sales went up by 40% online which is just amazing. Uh, okay, it started from a relatively low base of about seven, eight percent, but we saw a 40% rise in food online sales, simply because people were either seeing that there were disruptions in the supply chain, which happened particularly at the beginning, and therefore did grocery, uh, grocery buying online. And then in terms of non-food, where you had in many countries, the uh, so-called non-essential shops closed altogether. If you wanted to buy clothing or if you wanted to buy electrical goods, you had essentially to go online. I would agree entirely with both speakers that I think this is here to stay. There's no sign, despite the fact that the shops have reopened, of people um, declining very much in, in their use of online sales. I think People who were not used to it before, as, as Mr. Boats was saying, um, have now got used to it and think, actually, this is not a bad way of doing it, frankly, and we'll go on doing it. That said, uh, we as merchants like cash because it's cheap. Cash costs money. The banks charge you for having changed. They charge you for accepting cash. So it's not entirely free. But there's some interesting uh, research which has just come out in the UK, which I think is probably fairly um, typical of most countries, that in a typical transaction, a merchant will pay about two euro cents for accepting cash. He will, with the debit card, particularly one of the ones <clears throat> from the two major card schemes, 
will end up paying somewhere between seven and eight cents per transaction. And if it's a credit card, you'll be paying between 21 and 25 cents per transaction. So cash is still cheap and it has other advantages as well for people who don't necessarily want to have every transaction that they make uh, recorded by somebody else. So there's the anonymity side of it. But for us, it's also another important um, factor. And you know, I think it is inevitable that cash payments will continue to go down. And in some countries, you know, if you take Sweden as a good example, you know, it's really quite difficult to use cash anymore. Um, but cash has a, a, another function, which is essentially that it is an alternative to some of the other payment methods. And what I wanted really to talk to you very briefly about was some of the concerns that we have if cash disappears altogether. We pay somewhere in the region of 5 billion euros a year to cash, um, to, to card companies just for the transactions that are um, undertaken across Europe. What we have seen in the last 18 months, despite there being regulation at EU level, which we're very grateful for, is that we have paid an extra 1.2 billion in fees to the card uh, issuers or to the card schemes rather, uh, who have been putting up their fees to, first of all, the issuing banks, but also to the uh, acquiring banks uh, who are members uh, have to deal with. And if at the same time, the retail sector has seen in some areas an increase in turnover, but in many other areas, about a 30% uh, decrease in turnover, that's real money against very, very low um, margins. Our typical margins in retail are about one to 3% only net. And if you then take the hospitality sector, which obviously um, has already been mentioned by Mr. Boats, they're in deep trouble already, and I'm afraid are starting to see in many countries themselves being closed down again. We therefore need cash and we need alternative payment systems to try and keep some check on two very large and powerful players in the payment system. Um, I agree equally with Mr. Burtz that it would be great if we could get as quickly as possible an instant payment system, for example, the SCT INST at European level as an alternative to card payments, particularly since we're going to see an acceleration even further, I think, of online sales. Um, the digital euro is very interesting, although I think merchants will want to know a little bit more about exactly you know, the mechanics of it, if you like, but certainly we're not against that idea at all. But I think there is a message I would like to leave with the group, if I may, which is that um, one of the jobs I did many years ago was as a telecoms regulator, and I was involved in the uh, liberalization of the telecoms market in Europe and for a matter in the UK. And one of the things we found was that the only way that you can get new startups to actually work in a market which is dominated by very large incumbent players is to regulate them. And I think what we will need to make sure that the EPI, for example, the European Payments Initiative, really takes off this time is actually to look and see how we make sure that it is not rendered commercially unviable by the actions of powerful players who are already in the market. And if I can tell you that four initiatives in the past 10 years have failed because they were not commercially attractive, uh, there is, I think, a, a real need there. Anyway, I will stop there, but I just wanted to say um, I really very much welcome this discussion and I very much welcome also all of the really very innovative ideas which are coming out of uh, the European Central Bank, but also some of the banks uh, nationally as well to see whether um, payments can become a slightly less painful subject for, for my members at least. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. McMillan, for your, uh, for your words. Um, yes, indeed, the question is what happens if cash uh, disappears entirely? And thank you very much for pointing out the, um, uh, the difficulties the hospitality sector has to 
uh, has to put up with uh, right now in, in these times. And, and of course, uh, <clears throat> you uh, sort of pointed out what doing away with cash entirely would mean for certain sectors of the um, uh, for certain sectors of the economy. Uh, and of course, uh, some sectors of the economy are still dependent. Uh, thank you for making that point uh, on uh, uh, on cash. And you also mentioned alternative payment uh, payment methods. Maybe we can talk about that, elaborate a little later on. Um, Peter Robeshek is our next uh, keynote speaker. He holds a master's degree in finance and economics from Hagen University. And he obtained a PhD in finance from the University of Durham. Uh, since July 2019, Mr. Obeshek <clears throat> holds the position of head product management, Germany and Switzerland uh, with MasterCAD <clears throat> and oversees initiatives related to open banking and new pay payment platform. Um, he was previously director of data and services with MasterCAD from 2017 to 2019. Uh, so, Mr. Obeshek, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Mr. Gerwald, and, and thank you to all my uh, co-speakers or prior speakers for the interesting topics that you raised. Usually it's kind of interesting to have a debate where there are many conflicting views. It turns out that this is a pretty harmonious round, and, and I'm not about to change that, I'm afraid. Um, but. Um, let me maybe start with, on a slightly philosophical note. And um, so I think we have in this room a very good representation of the payment uh, ecosystem. And we're all at the service of the members of that ecosystem, consumers and businesses in particular. And so I want to talk about three things. Um, one is a way in which we have met uh, the expectations of the ecosystem. One is a way in which we are at risk of very soon falling short of meeting the expectations um, of our constituents in the payment ecosystem. And one way is, is, a, is a very easy way in which we can make sure that we will continue meeting the expectations of the payment ecosystem in the future. So as Mr. Balz has very eloquently pointed out, um, during the pandemic, the behavior of consumers um, with regard to cash has changed. We find in our own research that um, of the people who indicated that they would use more cashless payments, 35% of them would continue doing so, regardless of whether there was a pandemic or not. And counterintuitively, this figure was even higher in the, in the group of 70 plus year olds, out of whom 46% said they would continue their changed habits. More importantly, 90% of respondents believe that the acceptance of card payments should be a regular service in stores. 90%. And of course, this is largely due to contactless, as we've heard, and, and I don't need to repeat the figures because uh, fortunately it looks like we're uh, all running solid research. Um, three quarters of people uh, who paid contactless uh, have increased their contactless payments over the last six months, very much consistent with the figures we heard before. And I think this is a great example of where, uh, an instance where the payments ecosystem uh, came together beautifully um, and, and reacted very fast to the pandemic, namely with the adjustment of the um, contactless no CVM limits uh, that happened. And this was an act by the payments ecosystem for its constituents, and it worked fabulously. And this is all, of course, part of a broader secular shift. We've heard that um, consumers have shifted a large part of their spending to the online sector, uh, even for non-traditional categories such as food, um, we see this shift in general, if we just listen to John Donahoe, the CEO of Nike, he said, we know that digital is the new normal. The consumer today is digitally grounded and simply will not revert back, clearly in line with the payment behavior that we've been discussing. And here is a real danger that's looming on the horizon that we as the payments ecosystem will fail um, the expectations of our constituents. And that is uh, hidden in the strong customer authentication component of PSD2, with which still a large number of businesses, in particular in Germany, are struggling um, regarding the implementation. And now, uh, should that not go smoothly, then there will be a lot of chaos in payments. And this will affect us all, especially as consumers, of course. And so it should be in everybody's interest um, to avoid this kind of a dilemma in 2021. And, and so this would greatly benefit from clarity um, 
provided by national competent authorities on, on the ramp up and, uh, and enforcement of strong customer authentication. And of course, um, the third point, one way of ensuring that in the future we continue meeting the expectations of uh, our constituents and the payments ecosystem is to give what uh, we have heard before, uh, I think Mr. McMillan mentioned this, a freedom of choice. So that means plurality of payment methods and um, the consumer alone will choose which payment she wishes to use where. And against this backdrop, I think that the, the title of, of the discussion, Have the Germans Changed Their Love for Cash? is actually, you know, might be true, it might be temporarily true. 65% of respondents to our research said, yes, we have been reducing our use of cash, but that's actually not the right question, in my opinion. I think that the right question to ask is how to make sure that Germans and Europeans, for that matter, can pay in the way that they love most at any given moment. And I think the, the right way of ensuring that is clearly freedom of choice. At all points of sale, um, domestically, across borders, they should be able to rely on the payment means that they like. And that might well be cash. So we need a level playing field of payment methods. And uh, that should be sweeping and, and equitable. Um, and if I see that during Amazon Prime Day, I was able to uh, purchase a sum up terminal for 14 euros 99, there's really very little in terms of barriers to entry that, that I can see uh, in terms of offering um, cashless payments. So in summary, I think that at a time when we're talking about instant payments, when we're talking about central bank digital currencies and, and, and blockchain applications, it seems slightly absurd, actually, that we're even debating whether or not electronic payments should or should not be possible everywhere. Of course, they should be possible everywhere in the interest um, of all participants in the ecosystem. Mr. Obeshe, thank you very much um, for your contribution. Um, and you sustained uh, and supported the uh, assessment that had been made before, in particular by Burkhard Belt, but also by others, uh, that the behavior changed the pandemic. Uh, interesting, uh, the survey seeing 90% believing that uh, card payment should be made available to everybody if, if, if necessary. That, I, I think that's a pretty high figure. Uh, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have guessed that it was that high. Anyway, um, I would like to uh, come to our last speakers today. Our lady, only lady today, Mrs. <laughs> Reschneider. Thank you for being with us. Um, uh, Mrs. Reschneider is a colleague. She um, uh, studied law at the University of Vienna and started out as an associate at both Thai solicitors, um, uh, which is a, a pretty uh, well-known um, law office, a law, of, law firm all over the, in particular, German-speaking countries. And uh, after working in regulatory affairs at Erste Group Bank uh, since 2013, Mrs. Reschneider currently holds the position of Head of European Affairs at the Austrian Savings Bank Association. And so she is part-time in Brussels, part-time in Vienna. Where are you now, Mrs. Reschneider? At the moment, I'm in Brussels, so <laughs> locked, locked in, in my home. Uh, but. Um... Yeah, thank you very much for the nice introduction. And um, maybe let me uh, send everyone through around uh, with some figures. Let me also give you some figures um, back uh, from Austria and um, maybe it's being um, part of one of the countries that definitely in uh, Europe next to Germany loves cash the most. Um, I, I uh, prepared a few figures. So. Um, Austrians love cash. What does this mean? There was a survey conducted in 2017 by the ECB and they saw that 67% the of the Austrians prefer to pay in cash. So 67%. This is a whole lot. If we see the other uh, side of the coin, it's 33% um, that uh, prefer the use of cards and if you compare that to other uh, countries that were um, took part in this survey was uh, 33 percent um, in Finland in contrary to 67 percent in Austria that use cash in France 28 percent in the Netherlands 27 percent so in Austria still a lot of people use cash 
Um, in the beginning of 2020, our National Bank conducted a survey where they said that the use of cash uh, still is um, around 60%. So there is a digital evolution. And uh, even if Austrians love cash, um, there is a decrease of around 2% per year. However, since the topic today is Corona and what uh, happened during the, um, during, um, the crisis now, um, I, uh, I took two um, very interesting facts um, here that I wanted to discuss with you. And the first one is, it was very interesting, we had a lockdown on the 13th of March, so it was Friday the 13th of March this year. And what we saw is that uh, the people next to <laughs> the um, urge to buying toilet paper went to the um, cash machines. And we saw an increase, a dramatically increase of withdrawal of money. So on Friday the 13th, the day of the lockdown in Austria, we had four times higher uh, withdrawal than we had uh, we have on a on a regular Friday, so this is a huge amount, and that shows that even if there is an increase in in digital um, or cashless payments, that still people in times of crisis want to have a cash under their pillow. So this was very interesting to see. However, after a few days, after people saw that this time. Uh, the health crisis and the economic crisis doesn't lead to a bank crisis, so there's always enough cash coming out of the cash machine. This turned, then the behaviors turned, and indeed, that uh, was all the speakers said today. We we also monitored that, of course, that the the cashless payments increased. So during um, the peak of the crisis, we were at um, fifty percent. So. If we um, think back of the numbers, it was 60% of um, cash payments in the beginning of the year. Then during the crisis, we had uh, 50%, so it lowered by 10%, and now it is back up to 55%. What does this mean? So I think that, yes, people starting to pay more online and digital and cashless, However, I think that this trend has only started. It accelerated, the crisis accelerated, but still there is a long way to go. And um, we conducted a survey um, now during, uh, during um, April and May, and people told us there are uh, two reasons why they started to pay a lot more in, um, without cash and by card only. And the one was already mentioned today, it is the fear that uh, the cash may be contagious. So you might get Corona out of the cash, even if this is not um, proven, but this is the one big fear. And the second um, point that actually uh, drove people to more uh, being more cashless um, was the EVA statement to enhance the um, payment without the car payment without PIN from 25 to 50 euros. Because what we see is that um, cash, usually people pay by cash very small amounts. Um, so small amounts from 20 to 30 euros. And if you have an already large amount of 50 euros, and this is very easy to pay without any PIN, that this enhances the, um, the cashless payments. So this was very interesting to see. Um, so what, I, uh, what, what we say is that, uh, see is that um, this is, uh, the trend is going in this direction. However, um, we need a transition because not every um, part of the population is connected to internet. Not everyone um, can really use that. And this is valid for SMEs, but it's all, all also valid for part of the population that sometimes also in areas where there um, is maybe the, um, the wires um, is quite patchy, the, the, the connection that uh, maybe um, online um, banking or digital payments are not always possible. So we need to um, 
be aware about this and to help the customers as well to onboard. What we saw is, and this is very interesting, that um, older people were the ones that really um, had most of the, um, or, or that was the part of the population that had um, most of the increase of the cashless payments, because those were the ones in Austria, for instance, that really rely on the cash and that love to pay with cash. And also for them, since they were locked at home, since they had they were afraid of, of paying uh, with contagious money, they started to use um, cards and they started to use also digital banking or, or bought some things online. And I think it is this first time, which is always very hard for people, which um, all in our round already had a few years ago, but um, some of the older people um, still, it is still kind of a, a hurdle for them. So um, what maybe um, what we see in the European Union, and this was all also pointed out from the policymakers, um, we very much support the retail payment strategy, which um, came out a few weeks ago from the European Commission. And we also see that the instant payments and to provide a European solution would be very important. And I think um, what uh, Neil said in terms of cash is expensive is partly true. Cash is uh, cash, is, is cash, is, cash is cheap is partly tr true because for a bank uh, cash is always very uh, expensive because you have to mint it, to print it, to have vaults, um, to sort it at the, at the till, for example. But I think that if you have a European uh, uh, scheme and, and European means that uh, this um, that um, online or cashless payment would um, get uh, cheaper as well. So I think we should get there. However, uh, always very important um, that the bureaucratic um, and the administrative burden is kept as low as possible. And there I see that for uh, some SMEs, it is um, quite a challenge to have um, not only digital solutions, but also to keep up with all the new regulation that is coming. So we really need to do an effort here in the European Union to enable um, European uh, solutions and to make them available to our SMEs so that in the end the population can use it. So yes, I think um, <laughs> there is a development there and an acceleration, but still there's a long way to go. I'm not sure whether we will see uh, a cashless um, society in maybe our, our children or maybe in other countries faster than in Austria, maybe in Sweden or the Nordic countries. I think in Austria, we still have quite a time to go to get there, um, but definitely that the um, uh, train is going in this direction. So, yes. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Reschenida. Austrians love cash. Uh, same obviously goes goes for Germans. Now, why that is a German-speaking problem, I, I I can't really I can't really assess that. Uh, but uh, I remember, by the way, very well, March 13th was the very day when I cut my skiing uh, holidays short in, in Kärnten and left Kärnten for Bavaria. Um, uh, uh, but it's, uh, uh, but it's, it's a comforting, it's comforting use that ATM still provides sufficient, uh, provided sufficient cash and will continue to provide sufficient cash for people uh, if, they, if they took uh, to the ATMs um, again. Uh, Mr. McMillan, um, maybe I would like to start the discussion uh, here because Mrs. Reschen either made a point, um, uh, and that was a question that came to my mind when I listened to you before, um, and because I recall that during, let's say, the peak of the crisis, I got turned away at various retail facilities trying to pay in cash, uh, simply because people feared that cash would be a means of transmission of the virus. Uh, has that been in any way uh, sustained by any, by any analysis? Uh, well, certainly the ECB were very uh, quick to um, share some really quite good evidence that coins and cash don't actually transmit um, the disease any more than any other surface might do so. Um, I think when it started, nobody really knew what they needed to do. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, and therefore playing it on the safe side also for the staff apart from anything else. And it was actually concerned about staff catching the disease from customers that led a lot of our members to say, look, we'd much prefer just to take cards if we can. I think almost all retailers will accept cash all the same, but sometimes they limit the number of tills that will will handle it uh, compared with what it was before. Could I actually just make one other little point, which I think Absolutely. is an important one, which is that cash is also incredibly important for small retailers because our large members can actually negotiate with their banks and with the card schemes to reduce the cost for them of accepting cards. Uh, but what happens then is that the small retailers end up not getting any of those discounts and therefore paying the full amount. And what is also happening, because banks, as, as, as uh, was quite rightly said by Amrit, you know, it costs banks money also to handle cash. If you are handling small amounts of cash, and if the cash volumes are decreasing, the unit cost of handling a piece of cash also increases. And that means, again, if you are an SME retailer using the bank to process your cash, which you have to, uh, you end up also probably having to pay more the less cash that's circulating. So it can be quite a nasty, vicious circle for SMEs. Okay. Well, thank you for, for making this point. And uh, thank you also, Mrs. Reschneider, for making the point that a particular part of our society is more affected than other parts. So you, you, you pointed out older people, so they, they're like, say, older generation uh, that is more used, let's, let's put it that way, or less used to pay cashless uh, is more affected by this, by this trend that's been accelerated by the, uh, by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so um, I would now like, we have roughly 15 minutes left and maybe Henrik has some questions for us from the audience. Uh, uh, if, there, if there are any questions, please, Henrik, speak up. Not so far, but the audience is free to write them in the chat. Okay, so, all right. But I will let you know if somebody comes back to us. So I'll fire it back to our group of, um, of experts, and maybe I'll start with Burkhardt, and, um, and, and would like to ask him if, if he's got any comment to what's been, uh, what's been said um, in the meantime by the other, uh, by other, other experts. Well, my comment on uh, that is definitely that we can see that COVID is, uh, of course, um, um, changing really behaviors within the payments area sector. And when you look at uh, all the other comments and uh, uh, remarks from the other speakers, you could easily say that we are here in a very vibrant uh, environment. Um, it's not only COVID, but then also the technological progress. And um, I'm very grateful that SME Europe, of course, raises uh, such, a, such a discussion here this afternoon, because from my perspective, and uh, you have uh, also mentioned it, that I have been also like you, uh, a member of the European Parliament. Um, it's, for me, it's absolutely clear also that um, uh, uh, all these new developments in other parts of the world, uh, global uh, developments, uh, we have to deal uh, with. And um, strategically, I think it's important for Europe to have their own solutions and answers to, to, to this new development. So, I don't want to come into a situation here on the continent within the European Union. I'm not only speaking about the Euro system, the Euro zone, um, that we only can have uh, choices between uh, um, competitors or companies from other parts uh, of the world. And that's why we have lots of pressure. Central banks also the private business um, uh, on that really to develop our payment schemes here in Europe. And I think 
this discussion this afternoon shows that uh, quite clearly uh, that we have really to, to push up uh, things uh, uh, quite quickly. Okay, thank you, Burkhardt. Um, now, uh, one of our current MEPs, Georgios Kirtsos, would like to um, would like to make a comment um, and a contribution. Georgios, please. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Good. Okay, fine. <laughs> because you have problems communicating uh, in the European Parliament. That's why I'm asking <laughs> always. So uh, I have to tell you that in Greece we love. Uh, uh, cars even more than the Germans and the Austrian friends. The only problem is that we run out of money. So we love cars in Greece, but we run out of money. I just published my new book uh, with, uh, with the title uh, In the Labyrinths of the Pandemic. Labyrinth is a Greek word, pandemic is a Greek word. Unfortunately, the 405 pages of the book are in Greek as well. Uh, as, and I analyzed the situation in global terms and European terms and national terms of what's going on with the pandemic. So we can, and there are special chapters uh, that uh, describe how the digitalization of the modern world is, uh, is being accelerated by the pandemic and how the China uh, is performing better than the other major economic powers, which means, uh, and China is, uh, closer to a cashless society than we are. Uh, so the, they are setting the trend, the Chinese and the American, as far as digitalization is concerned. And the Chinese are already developing their economy, whereas um, we have a lot of problems in the European Union. Uh, in the European Union, the uh, German friends are the supposedly successful because their GDP is going to fall by four to 5% uh, in, more or less 5% in 2020. And the others, uh, Italians, Greeks, uh, Spaniards, etc., we are about to fall from 9 to 12%. So we are in deep trouble. I have to tell you that in Greece, uh, we have a peculiar phenomenon that uh, we are moving to, towards castless, um, castless society through successive crises. Uh, because uh, the last time that uh, uh, we, uh, you know, we, in, a, in a way we run out, uh, we moved away from uh, cars. It was in June 2015, there was a Greek crisis at the time, uh, when we had the imposition of restrictions on capital transfers and cash withdrawals. Uh, so people had to cope with this situation. Uh, and, and the other problem that we have in Greece is um, we have a huge public debt. Now it is in the range of 200% of GDP. And uh, the successive governments keep trying to increase tax revenues. And there is a lot of, uh, so they have to curb tax evasion. And the obvious uh, way to, to curb tax evasion in Greece is to limit the use of cash because the more cash you have, the more uh, tax evasion you have. Um, and we made significant progress. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, the number of point uh, of sale POS, POS terminals uh, increased considerably between uh, 2015 and 2018. We moved from 2019,000 to 690,000. So there is movement. And um, uh, I think that uh, this movement towards the cashless transactions will be accelerated to, due to COVID-19. Nevertheless, um, we, are, we cannot reach definite conclusions because the situation has been complete, completely destabilized. Uh, for instance, we, we started the year 2020 planning on a growth of 2.8%. And now we are facing a drop of our GDP by, by eight to 10% after a, a drop of 20% uh, during the past decade. So it's not a stable situation. You cannot reach uh, uh, definite conclusions. Uh, we also have a double digit uh, deficit, uh, public debt to 200% GDP. 
record private debt, record in NPL, second wave of COVID-19 related NPLs, banks in a difficult position due to the crisis in 2015. And unfortunately, the pandemic is still with us, which means that we cannot make uh, economic and financial planning. Uh, maybe where uh, Greece did rather well in uh, March and April, now we're not doing that well. We are following the, uh, the European trend. We are better than the European average, but this doesn't uh, really mean uh, a lot. Uh, and uh, so there is a digital transition, uh, but you also have strange, you have peculiar, peculiarities due to the intensity of the crisis. For instance, uh, bank deposits are going up for the first time in, uh, and we, in, in Greece, after 10 or 15 years, we are saving money, despite the fact that our re income keeps falling. Uh, people are afraid about the future, so they save some money and they cannot spend the money <laughs> because, you know, we, we are a services. Uh, 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 we depend on tourism services, going out, eating in restaurants, visiting bars, <laughs> all these things cannot happen in a normal way during the COVID crisis. And there is another tendency of cash holding because people, some people uh, are afraid that we'll have the same um, experience, the 2015 experience when the bank suddenly closed. Uh, so it's a peculiar situation. Uh, of course, the trend is towards digital transformation. This is a radiant future, but we, are, um, we have a tendency to return to the past as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Georgos. And thank you as well for, for um, again, pointing out the importance of um, the tourist industry. Uh, and in particular for countries like yours, that's been very massively, uh, massively affected by the COVID crisis. Maybe I would like to, to ask um, Burka, but we, it's already closing time. I would ask like Burka um, a last question as to the questions, uh, question of money laundering. Is there any reliable data to which extent the introduction of CBDC would decrease tax evasion and money laundering? Um, uh, has Bundesbank done some analysis to this, uh, to this extent? Yeah, Burkhard, you got to unmute yourself. There was a problem. I couldn't really understand you fully. Oh, okay. All right. Um, the question was money laundering tax evasion. Is there reliable data to which extent uh, the uh, CBDC or the introduction of CBDC would increase uh, tax evasion and, and money laundering? Uh, has there been analysis? I guess there has on, on the Bundesbank side. Of course, uh, many other central banks, not only the Bundesbank, uh, have already analyzed uh, that. And this is definitely a big issue when it comes to um, really the thinking of how to create, uh, specifically create a CBDC. So um, at the moment, of course, um, we are, um, as, as I said, in this um, uh, experimentation phase now, um, we have different projects under the ECB high level task force roof now, and we are analyzing, uh, analyzing um, the technology behind and issues we want to, to see in a uh, potential CBDC. Um, and uh, the only thing I could confirm is um, that of course, uh, the issues of tax evasion and AML are, are big issues within our work uh, of analysis uh, at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Any, anybody else would like to comment on that? Maybe from the bank side, Mrs. Ashnado? Maybe um, just uh, two short comments because the question was also why um, do the people love um, cash so much. And I think that um, you have the risks that people fear is first to say the, the, the privacy, to safeguard the privacy, because I think 
um, that if you start using um, cashless, if you only start using um, um, online banking and, and don't use cash at all anymore, um, I think that um, people fear that first of all the government knows everything you do and um, at the moment I mean we all live in democracy so this is very fine but uh, we never know where the data ends up and um, this um, then of course uh, together with linked with the second one uh, the private companies that uh, buy data that use data and even if we agree to so many things we maybe should read it more carefully um, what in terms and conditions there are, but I think that the fear is big um, if, amongst the population that the privacy um, to a certain extent uh, gets uh, smaller and smaller. So um, this is the one thing and the second thing is cyber risks. Um, that uh, personal data is stolen, that the data breaches nowadays um, is um, definitely a big problem. We invest a huge amount of money and so far um, everything um, is fine but it is a daily challenge and I think this um, is valid for small uh, groups and for large groups and for uh, uh, SMEs and um, it is of course uh, due to the economy of scales for smaller um, 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 entities um, more costly than for larger ones and this is a big threat cyber risks so I think uh, on the risk side, um, this might be the reason. And then of course there are opportunities and, and um, opportunities are to um, get uh, controlled tax evasion and, and money laundering. Um, so this would be an asset actually to cashless payments. Um, but yes, on the other side, there are some risks. So I think this is what, uh, what uh, people think of when they use it. Okay. All right. So we are here at 517. Uh, we and got one question from the audience. If one may, question from the audience, Henrik. Yes. Uh, good. Um, so it's coming from Andy Weber. He's asking, do you think the pandemic paved uh, the way for mobile payment systems already used in China and Southeast Asia, like WeChat or Alipay, or that that kind of payment uh, method has still no chance in Europe? Uh, that be possibly uh, a question for Mr. von Schirmeister or for Neil. Neil, maybe you want to start? Yeah, if I may, just to say that um, quite a number of our members operate in China and Alipay is certainly one of the, of the largest payment systems in the world now and it's coming to Europe and indeed um, on the back of a lot of Chinese tourists there were there was quite a lot of pressure on some of our members to accept Alipay as one of the, the alternatives. Um, what I would say about Alipay between friends, if I may, is that it is actually part of a, a slightly nightmarish um, ecosystem in which uh, Alibaba essentially banks your salary, sells you anything you want, sells your insurance, and also um, administers the Chinese government's so-called social credit system as well. So I hope it doesn't come to that because I think actually I would prefer a slightly more open system. And like Amrit said, there is a question also of what the government knows and what the government doesn't know. And if I may, I would, I would just add very briefly, yes, we are seeing alternative payment methods uh, making inroads. Uh, I don't believe paving the way at a very rapid rate necessarily, but maybe the fastest behavioral change we're seeing just in the last few months is the very quick adoption of QR codes. Many people didn't even know what a QR code was a few months ago, and all of a sudden they've had to learn how to use QR codes. And obviously many of those Asian payment systems are based on the premise of, of consumers and merchants understanding how to use them. That may pave the way for a bit of a, a new um, kind of ecosystem in Europe over the next few quarters. All right. Well, thank you very much for this um, uh, for this interesting round that we've had. Uh, and I won't sum up, but I, I would like just like to thank everybody to uh, for your uh, willingness to um, kick to come in today and to uh, 
uh, to contribute to this to this lively uh, debate and uh, uh, and share your thoughts and your insights with us. Um, I would perhaps uh, like to leave you and everybody with a small anecdote. About a month ago, my wife and myself decided to buy a new car. And when we had the deal done, uh, my wife asked the salesman, I don't really know why, um, uh, would you also accept cash? And, uh, and he went, uh, well, if you want to launder money. Uh, so eventually, uh, we wire transferred the money and kept our slush money. Thank you very much. Have a very nice afternoon and very nice evening. Thank you very much for being with us today.